Hi, I'm Stephen Price. Hello, I'm Cara Githens. This is The Innkeepers, a podcast by Sanctuary Inn. At Sanctuary Inn, we believe we are called to equip, refresh, and restore God's global workers. On this podcast, we will be interviewing guests who have much to teach us about the many facets of missionary care. Let's learn together and be encouraged to press on in the work God has given each one of us to do. Hi, this is Steve. Hello, this is Kara. And we'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Innkeepers podcast. Yes, we are glad to be here again today. And we get to interview Larry Sharp today. He is the founder and current consulting specialist with the, the consulting firm International Business and Education Consultants, other known, otherwise known as IBEC Ventures. He served for 21 years in Brazil um, as a missionary, uh, and then he, later on he spent another 20 years as a cross-world VP of Operations and Vice President of Business Partnerships. Um, so from there, he went on to, to really get into business and mission, and we'll hear more about his uh, experience and kind of how that grew in our conversation today. Mm-hmm. Um, he and his wife, Vicki, live in Washington State, and they have been married for 51 years and have four grown children and eight grandchildren. Wow. So we are privileged to be speaking with Larry today. He brings a lot of wisdom, and uh, we are looking forward to it. Yes, and I'm just going to say my voice isn't 100% today because even though we're having the wettest spring on record, there's still some allergy pollen something out there, and I have fallen victim to this. So anyway, we're doing our best, and but thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy learning about business as mission. Well, we'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Innkeepers podcast. Our guest today is Larry Sharp, and uh, Larry's um, an expert. Uh, he may not see, but in our eyes, he's an expert on the area of business's mission, and I think that's a really valuable area to spend some time with. So let's um, spend some time with Larry Sharp. So Larry, thanks for being here with us today. And can you just start out by introducing yourself and sharing some of your missions experience and kind of how you got into business as mission? Okay, thanks, uh, Steve and Kara. I, my wife and I went to Brazil in 1972. So uh, we are more or less in the dinosaur class. And uh, we spent 21 years there. Uh, I was mainly in the area of education and uh, administration. Uh, I just thankful that early in my career, the Lord uh, caused me to meet people that helped me understand how God had gifted me and experienced me and expected me to contribute to his kingdom. So I was headmaster of the MK School, Amazon Valley Academy, uh, for 15 of those years. In the last six, I was president of Brazilian Mission. So I was very much in touch with uh, things like church planting and radio evangelism and uh, boat, boat ministry and different types of things that were being done during those days. And uh, so after 21 years, we went to the home office of our mission, which is Crossworld in uh, the Philadelphia area. Okay. And, uh, and we uh, spent the next uh, 20 years as VP of operations. Uh, and it was during that time, this would be uh, in the early 20, 2000s, um, that missionaries were experiencing lots of difficulties overseas. And uh, people were struggling to know how they could stay in countries. And there were different types of thinking going on. And the, the business as mission term had been in vogue maybe five or six years. And uh, although the, the concept, which I'll describe a little later, uh, the concept has been around since the first century. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, so, the, so the, the idea of business as mission came to us. And uh, uh, we had an incident in... Uh, uh, the, the Republic of China, People's Republic of China, where the couple was losing their visa. And, and this couple had, uh, like so many of that time period, and unfortunately still today, uh, he, the, he had been in business for 10 years, had been successful. The Lord had challenged him through his word and also through a speaker at a conference that he should uh, maybe, uh, he, he should do something cross-culturally f- for the gospel. 
And so he goes to his pastor and the pastor said, well, yeah, you just go to seminary. You must, you be like me. Everybody who really is at the top of the spiritual pyramid has gone to seminary and planted church. So that's what he did. And he went to China. And uh, so some years later where they were losing their visas and his wife said to him that you used to be a successful business person. Uh, and here you are sitting here wondering what to do. Why don't we start a business and share the gospel in everything we do and live like Jesus? And that's exactly what they did. And that business became quite successful. And they sold out to a bigger one. And they came back to our office. I'm making a, a long story short here. They came back to our office and they said, this pivoting comment to, to me, because I'd been appointed to figure out what this business's mission was. And they said, if, if only we'd have had some help, we could have saved a couple of years of our life. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, I, in some ways I felt bad about that, but in other ways it was a challenging time to be thinking, what does that all mean for us? Because, and as Patrick Lai says, the business as mission movement, which I guess I'll describe in a minute, it, it, there are people that are faking it, a job faking, there's job taking and job making. Uh -huh. And job, there's a lot of job faking going on. In other words, people were pretending to be business people which resulted in a, a, the application process for a business visa being successful, but they really weren't doing business. Now that's job taking. Job taking is the historic traditional tent making thing. And that's a good thing, taking a job overseas to be a gospel witness. And then the, the third one is business as mission, job making. So that's my little bit of my story. In, in 2006, then I started a, a coaching company by the name of Ibeck Ventures. And I was driven by two things uh, from the start. One is that the people over there that are starting businesses, what we call them kingdom businesses today, uh, they needed help. Uh -huh. and, they, and secondly, our churches in this country are full of business people who think that they're second class citizens with regard to the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. and no, no pastor has actually said that, but that's the feeling that they got. It gets yeah. implied. And, yeah. Yeah, it's implied. And so I want to address, I want to get those people. And I've go taken those people overseas with me pre-COVID just to lots of different places and just seen how God had had uh, helped them to understand that their part in the Great Commission is just as important as everyone else's. Hmm. And so they were able to help and they continue to do that. Ibeck Ventures now has about 40 of these people signed up to work full time or not full time, but f uh, with a with a specific project part time um, in coaching, consulting, mentoring, uh, providing uh, the expertise that they need. So that's what I'm, that's that's my little bit of my story. That's great. Thank you for sharing. So you touched on it and what business's mission is um, a little bit there in your definition and. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share in terms of a definition of business of mission? Well, I, I think it's important to realize that, that it's real business. In other words, a, a real business is measurable in terms of a balance sheet, uh, the profit and loss statement, jobs created, a product that uh, that's, meets the market need. Those kinds of things are, are clearly there. You uh -huh. know, it, and the second thing is there, which becomes a little bit, actually quite a bit uh, more difficult to, to, to measure. And, and that's what, what is the mission of God look like in that business? Yeah. And um, some are doing it well, some are not doing it so well, some aren't doing it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so that whole, that whole domain is the subject of a, a, a lot of discussion today. And for me, I call it the integration. In other words, the, the mission has to be clearly understood. That we, we believe in a, in a mission plan that is written down and can be evaluated regularly, just like a business does with their quantifiable uh, elements. And so uh, that integration is important in the end. So a very clear mission statement that's gospel related, and a very clear business and that's integrated. So that's very important that, that those two are uh, very, very apparent in the business. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> yeah, and you mentioned a little bit about business's mission in the area of the tent making. Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting in, in my, the mission that I've been involved with um, 
well, most of these years, uh, they have not have de they have decided not to take a, a robust business as mission track, and they've moved to uh, something that they're I think their tagline is all professions making disciples, and, okay. and so by so those all professions uh, I'm involved in the startup world, which is probably the hardest thing you can do. Imagine going to Yemen and starting a business. You know, we, we had two engineers there. And, or any any of these countries, the high risk countries, uh, but the tent making sector, you take a job. So so as Dwight Nordstrom, one of the great BAM workers in China, today um, well respected by the government and everything, he he says the, the the BAM world needs robust business people, and they need the mission world, the mission agency world. Because the mission agency world brings to the table lots of experience in making disciples cross-culturally, lots of experience of living in a foreign land and learning languages, lots of lots of experience in raising families in those contexts, lots of experience in crisis. And so that they bring that to the table. And so the business person can go in and get. So what my mission has done is simply said, what they did is they monetized what the mission agency can offer. You don't have to join the mission agency. You don't have to raise support, but the mission agency then can sell to the person who is taking a job with IBM in London or, or with uh, Exxon in, in Dubai or wherever. And they, they, are, they are paid, so they don't have to raise support, but they've done that to be a light in a dark place. Okay. And so that, that's, that's, to me, I, uh, to, to me, that's one of the great things of today's world. And I just challenge people everywhere I go is to we'll look for an opportunity to take your job uh, to a, a less reached country. Yeah, so that the mission agency kind of steps in as, as a coach to, the, yeah. to, the, the, to the business family that's going wherever and, and the agency can, can coach them. In, right. um, in some of the cross-cultural things that they, you know, they probably get a dose of it at, at work as part of the new assignment, but also they can get a more thorough dose um, with other agencies or organizations. Sure, exactly. Yeah, this is, that was helpful, that clarification that um, the BAM model is starting up a business mm -hmm. and, and making a business on the ground that maybe hasn't been there before or needs to be revamped or something like that. Sure. Whereas a tent making is, is an individual going to work a job somewhere with an yeah. already established. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example of a mission. It's, it's kind of a negative story, but it helps you understand. Um, the, there was a fellow who, or a team of four, four couples who raised over a million dollars and quit their job and they went to an East, a West African country uh, to start a business with a product that was already proven to be in demand. So they had a market for their product and they were gonna start this. And, and so they knew enough or had been coached enough to come to the agency and get some coaching, like you say, and, and they came to us. And uh, when I was still with, it, with the mission full time, and um, they came to us and we shared a lot of things and with them. And one of the things had to do with raising kids abroad because they were four couples that were taking kids abroad that were uh, not quite teenagers, but they were well, well on an age at eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 age. And so they, off they went. So they had the money to start. Uh, did they, um, uh, did they, they were clearly successful in business in their, their state here in the US. But what happened is that they were all they threw in the towel before 12 months was up. And the reason was these high octane business guys would not listen to their wives and would not pay attention to the, the important needs of housing mm -hmm. and uh, child education. Mm -hmm. And the, the families just kind of wilted in this faraway place and they gave up the towel and wasted over a million dollars of the, of the Lord's money. Wow. Now that's important. We, we, we had talked about that. We'd said the importance of having an, they were all crammed into one house. Can you imagine? For no, months and months. So. And it wasn't necessary. They had the money. Yeah. And, and so uh, the, 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 the two work together well, I think. It should, huh. it should work together well. Okay. Yeah. So when you um, are talking to someone, let's say um, 
a church or or someone that's maybe not that familiar with the business's mission idea. What are some of the misunderstandings that you run into? Um, what are some of the common misperceptions or misunderstandings that people raise with you? Well, um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, obviously can't cover them all, but one very clear one is that, um, and this is mostly pastors who, who um, you know, have well been well embedded in, in how church uh, workers think. They, they think business as mission is a passing trend. It, it's it's a it's a something that'll come and it'll go, and uh, and so uh, that's rooted in a misunderstanding of biblical history, and of theology itself. Mm. And so we're very strong in in our training in uh, pl different places like TriVenture.com, where we ask a lot, uh, most people to go through or any other uh, weekend seminars we do in churches and so on, be, that, that the whole business as mission concept is rooted in the great, in, in, since the time of Jesus, been rooted in the great commandment of Jesus and the great commission. Uh -huh. and, and now the great commandment in the second uh, section after love the, the Lord your God, really heart, soul, mind, is love your neighbor as yourself. Uh -huh. And so we extend that to what does love look like in a place in this world that has great oppression and has discrimination, it has poverty, it, it has um, all kinds of issues whereby people cannot flourish in the way that God intended, and they're without the gospel. Uh -huh. and, and so the great commandment is ultimately important to us, as well as the Great Commission. And there's no reason why they can't be combined. Uh -huh. If you think of what happened in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, Stephen had just been stoned, the persecution was all over the place, and it says the Christians basically left Jerusalem. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and guess who stayed? The, the, the apostles stayed. Huh. Now, they didn't lead the missionary charge. You know, we say, well, Paul led the missionary charge. No, he didn't. Those guys from Acts chapter 8 led the missionary charge. And what they did it, between that chapter and chapter 17, they were in Cyprus. They're all at the eastern seaboard of the Mediterranean. They were all across Asia Minor, Turkey. They were over into Greece. And there were churches everywhere. Uh -huh. uh, they stopped to think of it. These guys had never been to seminary. These guys didn't have ascending church. These guys didn't raise tons of money to, to, to let them live over there. So they didn't have any people looking after their kids, and they were speaking other languages. They went as workers. Whatever trade they had in Jerusalem, they took it. Right. And everywhere they spoke about Jesus. Okay. Now, that's business as mission without the name, but it's the same concept today. So th th that's something that people don't realize. Uh, they also don't realize that... Um, Biblically, work and faith are together from Genesis chapter one, right. and, and uh, it's the way God works. And uh, so that, I, for me, the, these challenges have to start from, and the actually the operation of business as mission uh, programs and, and uh, businesses uh, has a foundation in theology, and that has to come first. People have to understand that that's God at work in the world. It's not a passing fact. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay. It's a lifestyle of, of evangelism, of being a person of the gospel, no matter where you are, no matter what walk of life. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of videos I, 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 I tell, I used to demonstrate that where, where um, I tell you one fellow that was in China for his whole career, and he went to the authorities in the local city where he went, small city of only 8 million. That's a small one in, in <laughs> okay. China. And, and uh, he went to them and he said this. Now imagine doing this for missionaries 50 years ago doing this. He goes to, the, to, to all the party bosses and he, at, the, at the town office, city office. And he says, my name is, I'll just fake, fake a name, George. And I'm here with this business and I'm here to make you successful. And we, can we partner? Now, these guys, you know, never heard the gospel and they knew nothing about that. And as he built this business, he was in constant liaison with them and he wanted them to feel good about this business. He created jobs for 150 people. He brought people into the business that were disabled, which is unknown in China, especially at that time. And, and, and pretty soon 
the gospel was integrated into their minds. It wasn't just about a successful business that made this widget. It was about a business that cared for the community, provided jobs, took people off the streets who were disabled. And for, at first, they would say, well, so what that it's all about Jesus? Pretty soon they were saying, hey, well, who is this Jesus? Now, you can be a missionary for 100 years, and you wouldn't get any better than that. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. <clears throat> so what are some of the challenges, some of the spots where people get stuck in this in doing business as a mission? Well, um, I suppose not, not thinking about the, the, the spiritual part that's so integral to it, just to, to take a couple of practical things, first of all, is that you have to raise money up front, uh, startup capital. Yeah. And, um, you know, but missionaries have to raise support too. So mm -hmm. we, we train people who are starting this as you uh, approach your business friends or people who are interested in you as a person and ask for uh, capital for five to eight years to get the business going. And, and, and so the, 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 we've mitigated the issue of missionaries staying a career. And that, that really doesn't happen today anyway. It did for me. But, but, um, but, but so, so the financial, that's still money to raise. And we're talking about a lot of money up front to, to start the business. So that's one ch ch challenge. The, the other challenge that people don't realize, especially if they are the, the, the starter type mentality for anything or entrepreneurial, the, uh, you, there has to be an entrepreneurial person somewhere in, in the business. There may be maybe a team of four or five or six, but one of them has to be the go-getter type person. And, and that person is, is a personality that generally doesn't listen to other people very well. Uh, to, just to be frank with you, yeah. uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg didn't want to take on all those other people that made Facebook work, but he had to. It would never work only with him, but it wouldn't have worked without him. And, and so th that type of uh, bringing that together is a God thing. When you think about it, it might work well in Illinois or something, but you, we're now we're off in the Maldives. And so that's very, very different. And so that becomes a big challenge to take coaching help. And wherever I go, my, my first, even though we run a coaching company, a coaching group, uh, I always ask people to think about who is it in your church or your family that has skills, demonstrated life skills and business skills that could be helped you mm -hmm. and ask them to give you two hours a month. That's all two hours a month on, on Zoom to yeah. be able to coach you on something. And so that's a challenge. People, those kind of guys don't like to do that. They think they know it all. And, uh, and so it, they have to listen to their other team members. They have to listen to coaches and so on. And, and, and then a very big part of that is to have a prayer team. I, I think that uh, um, whether you've come from the missionary side or you're a hardwired business person, um, you have to realize that it's not going to be successful if people aren't behind you in prayer. And, and to get people to understand that and not just understand it and hope for it or pray for it even, but they've got to get people to, to, to really promise to do that and keep them supplied with information you know how it is with missionaries it's the uh -huh. same thing with it this part is still the same uh-huh so that's another big challenge i think yeah. do you think it's a little more challenging for a local church to uh well the relationship goes both ways for the business person to develop that strong relationship kind of the the responsibility sort of i'm responsible to a local church to check in and so on and then for also for the local church to say hey these guys are actually missionaries from our church they're doing missions differently than many of our missionaries but they're still missionaries and we still have a spiritual responsibility for their care yeah it's true i mean uh, you know i'm speaking a little bit I'm aging myself here a little bit, but, you know, historically the church had a big map of the back foyer and had little pins where they had all their missionaries. Well, you, you can't have this person on those, on that map, or you can't have them coming to speak honestly and thoroughly in front of the church. So one of the ways about that, for, for that is for, the, for a small group to take them on. Okay. Uh, to, and, and encourage that small group. It could be a, the whole group of a team or a, we, we call our thing at church a small group and there's 12 of us. And so if, if that, that group took on 
the business admission person with prayer and also visits, you know, spend their vacation in these places and, and encourage them on Zoom regularly. Those kinds of things should take place. And it can be done, but you simply don't have the big profile that the spiritual missionary had because he was on a board and he was on yeah. front of the church every four years, that kind of thing. Uh, so, so I, but I think th th there are ways to do that. And, and I think I think a keep a keep one key catalyst person on that small group can keep the flame alive, I think it should. Okay. okay. So it's a relationship, someone from the church really yeah. taking responsibility for a relationship with this non-traditional missionary per se and mm -hmm. even if they can't share as openly or then maybe they're not they're not a gifted speaker to you know preach up front there that's not their mm -hmm. strength they're an entrepreneur you know and so yeah i can see how having a small team to really engage and keep that going could make a difference yeah. and, and, and and it is true that the person who's the catalyst for the small group and the small group is really invested in that in that person doing business as mission, they can take using the uh, appropriate um, disguising tools that, that, that are out there, and they can bring prayer requests to the whole church or, or to the church bulletin or whatever is the way the church does it without mentioning their names and just say, we, we are praying every day or every time we meet for this couple in Asia, and they have a special need right now, and it's related to blah, blah, blah. And they can bring that to the whole church, but it's doing it that way. And uh -huh. so, but that is important. It's very important. Yeah, you're kind of touching on the fact that uh, that BAM is often used in closed access countries and as a way to really be, be a light in those places. And so that does bring limitations. Well, it, you have to realize if, if you add up the whole pop, 8 million people, 8 billion people in the world, about 5 billion about two thirds are in countries that you do not grant a, what they call a religious workers visa or, or a missionary visa. They don't grant that anymore. Okay. So, so, so you, you can't, I, I'm sorry for church people, but I, we still are sending missionary teams to what the missiologists would call reach countries. And, and I don't, that's fine. It's okay to be going to Mexico and Uganda in Brazil all the time, that's okay. It's, there's needs, there's no question about it. But we're not sending them in to the two thirds of the world that are unreached and the two thirds of the world that we can't get a missionary visa unless you create value in that in that company. I was in Mississippi a while back and staying in this these people's home, and a young a young lady came down the, came down the stairway and the the owner of the home introduced her to us and she was part of the philharmonic symphony orchestra in in uh, i think it was jackson mississippi and i said oh wow that's a big deal she's yeah i know and I practiced you know seven hours a day or something like that and and she, i said well what are you going to do next and she says you know i've taken a job as a violinist in the beijing philharmonic wow no that's not business but it's the same thing I were talking about. Wow. Absolutely. And she did that. It wasn't because it was high paying or she wanted to be a tourist and see the Great Wall. It wasn't that stuff. It's she wanted to be a light in a dark place. Wow. Uh -huh. I was thinking we had an interview a couple of seasons back with uh, Jolene Erlocker, Dr. Jolene Erlocker. She's uh, talked a lot about millennials and their passion to see change in the world. And I'm just wondering if you're seeing kind of an uptick in the business's mission in the interest, especially among millennials who want to go somewhere, do something, make a positive impact, uh, as opposed to following a more traditional mission model. Oh, yeah, there, there's no question about that. I, I, I think that uh, missions as we have known it in the 20th century, and this is kind of a pejorative way to say this, but that's dead. It wasn't alive in the first century. It wasn't alive for centuries. The, I see the 20th century as a very, very privileged century. Uh, uh, that, that, you know, if, can you imagine after the World War II, General MacArthur, who was in Japan, looking, uh, administering Japan, he said, what Japan needs is missionaries. Send missionaries. And that was on all the media in America. And within the next five years, 5,000 missionaries went to to Japan. Can you imagine that happening today? Mm -hmm. I mean, 
the world is, the 20th century was amazing. And the great revivals in Papua, uh, New Guinea, all these places where thousands of people came to Jesus in one day because the cultural implications of that and so on. You, you know, the, the, in, in Africa as well, there are so many places that God used the open the world at that time to bring the gospel. Into, uh, but the 21st century is different. And, and there's no, so to, to, to go to the specifics of the question, yes, young people are going to respond to, to something. I'm involved with the Freedom Business Alliance, which is a, a, an association of over 100 businesses that um, create jobs for uh, mainly women, but some uh, young people as well, who are coming out of human slavery or the trafficking industry. Now, the people say, that's called a social enterprise. So, so social enterprise is a big thing in the secular world. And, and it's because, because of the mentality of today's young people that you're talking about is that they, CSR, for example, in business, corporate social responsibility, everybody wants to be known to doing some social good. And, uh -huh. and, 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 and so as in the BAM world, a social enterprise like uh, the, the freedom businesses is something that appeals to people because it's doing some human good. Now, historically, the BAM businesses were not necessarily social businesses. I mean, the, the social element was you're creating jobs. I uh -huh. mean, I, I remember going into, into Bosnia after the war and standing on a bridge over the, the Drina River and saying to three business guys who were with me, what if Jesus walked up on this bridge and, and we had the opportunity to ask him a question? And we said, what would Jesus do? There was 65% unemployment. And winter was coming. People had, are victims of the war. And, and, and when I asked that question, they started to say, well, let's, let's, let's bring over some containers of shoes. Well, good idea. And we did. Well, let's have uh, some food trucks come in on a regular weekly basis. And we did. Let's uh, do this and do that. But I said, what Jesus would do is come in here and create jobs for these people and get the economy going as a, as a human thing to do and do it in the name of Jesus. And, and, uh, and to me, that, that's the heart of a business mission. And it does touch what people, young people are concerned about today. The human, the, the humanity that is lost mm -hmm. from a human perspective, not just a spiritual one. Yeah, okay. we're whole people. So to approach doing business as mission means that you're addressing the whole person. Of, That's right. You need a job, yeah. you need food, you need, you need a savior, you need a That's all. right. That's right. A lot of that comes out of the, the, the theology of John Stott in the UK and the Luzon movement and those thinkers there it, it began to say, you know, we are whole people and, and we don't have to be, you know, one of the problems with the theology of the 20th century in the 20s, we began, we evangelicals started to call the social gospel uh, something that was bad. Mm. But what, it, what was bad is it ignored the spiritual. Now, we evangelicals don't want to ignore the human because it is, we are whole people. And just like you said. Yeah. yeah. Could you um, share some examples of someone that started a business and how it's had an impact in the local culture, economy, employing jobs, giving people, you know, um, something to live for, something to work for? Yeah, I can, I can take an next hour with that if you like. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, let, let's just take uh, a young couple. This one doesn't have to be uh, veiled, but uh, James and Erica Bartle, they are from Australia. Uh, she was an editor of a women's magazine in, in Melbourne. And um, she went to uh, the Southeast Asia on some kind of a tour. And she saw the, 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 the endemic uh, of, of women and children and young girls trapped in human slavery. She came back and told her husband, and then they watched the movie Taken, and they went to their pastor and they started to talk about this, what should we do? And, and uh, they decided to go on a, together on a trip. To make a long story short, they started a company about an, uh, 45 minutes north, northeast of Phnom Penh that creates high-end denim jeans 
uh, those the denim jeans are they sell from two hundred dollars up. So uh, I didn't buy any for my kids for, for, yeah. for <laughs> Christmas. So um, so they started this just in the backyard. It's just a proverbial story of of success. And, and they said we're doing this to rescue these women. They were only women uh, that, that they were bringing into the company. They started with five. And they didn't know where this thing was going to go. But to, to, t- to make a long story short, this today, there's 150 women. They're all sitting in front of a, a machine. And they're, the, 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 part of their business model is that every element of the gene, it, the, the, the uh, worker does. So they, would, they go to this big old storeroom with these big rolls of denim that come from Turkey. And they pick out the denim they want to work with. And they everything from there to put into a plastic bag and ship to the markets in London and New York and Sydney and these big places. And, and uh, they do it all. Wow. So and one person them. does the whole? The whole process of making the gene. And then they sign their name on the little leather thing on the back. And, 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 and the reason for that is that they are creating marketable people. When they can't be there anymore or, or want to move on, they have a skill in various domains. And... Uh, and so every day, these people who are, are basically a Buddhist uh, religious background and have been, been human slaves for so long, many of them, um, they hear about Jesus. And there's prayer and, and, and there's encouragement to understand how Jesus can make a difference. And, and, and that has really, uh, in their case, I wouldn't say it has transformed their community. Uh, but it has made a big difference because these women have come off the streets of Phnom Penh. They've come out to this business and, 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 and people in Phnom Penh want to join businesses like that. And there are other ones, sm- smaller ones that are struggling. But this one has been very successful and God has used it. And they've kept, you know, there's a lot of talk in missions today about mission drift. Yeah. They've kept the mission there. You know, they haven't become well in other sector businesses lost to lost the the primary, the initial vision. No, it's it stayed with them. And uh, uh, I actually, I have a book coming out at the end of this month. It's called Missions Disrupted, uh, oh. and the the subtitle is from professional missionaries to missional professionals. So, so the whole idea is that 50 years ago, the professional missionary was the primary methodology that God used to bring the gospel to the nations. And, and it was a good thing. There's no criticism of that at all. But we're gradually shifting to what we're talking about here. And, and they're an example for, from that. Here's another one. Uh, I'm a Canadian still. Even my, my wife wishes I'd become an American like her. But um, you can <laughs> cut that part out too if you like. Uh, a guy from British Columbia who went to Southeast Asia, bought up a small little kitchen bakery and uh, over time, he, he, um, he said, when I last talked to him, I think he had th- over 300 employees in 13 bakeries. These countries in Southeast Asia, they locked down after on COVID, and he was bang out of business. He took, uh, I think it was uh, 40 managers from these 13 locations, and they met together in one place, and they prayed, and they said, from the beginning, this was God's business. So we're going to ask him in all three of our languages, to what, what should we do? And, and because we are, we are doing this for God. And, and if he wants to close down his own business, that's up to him, But if, no matter what the government says. And so wh- what they did is they prayed, that little three-day retreat, they prayed and talked, and within a week, God opened up whole new markets for them. They were selling, uh, like any bakery on the, on the street, to, to whoever walked in. Now they are delivering baked goods and coffee to the embassies of their countries, to, to major schools and uh, professional buildings, and they're delivering it there, and they've never been so profitable. Wow. Now that all happened just during COVID, but I, I think the Lord blesses, I'm not saying that if a business isn't successful, they're not doing the right things. But oftentimes we know that God does bless if we bless if we keep Him first, and that certainly was true in there in His case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a we have a mutual friend, and I'll just uh, it's not important his name and, and and his country and so on. But you know he had a business going, 
And uh, unfortunately, there was a visa issue that that um, caused their family to have to leave. But uh, his target audience wasn't the people that were his target audience were all the people he would make routine contact with the bus drivers, the hotel keepers, the tour guides. And those those are the people that because he would book the same people over and over again. And so as he used those people, he had the opportunity to live the life of Christ in front of them and to be fair with them, to be honest to them and to bring them business. And so that was, you know, he had a business that was working, but his target really were the people behind the scenes that most of the other people never saw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a very viable model. So if someone wants to learn more about how to go about doing good businesses mission, what are some resources um, that you would recommend? Well, a, a, a two websites, uh, businessasmission.com. Okay. The, that's the best one. One that's closely aligned with it has some of the same people uh, speaking on it is bamglobal.com. One word, B-A-M global.com. A, th a third one would be my own um, organization, IBEC Ventures, which is I B as in boy E C Ventures uh -huh. dot com, and we have a we weekly blog there that changes every week. Has done that for the last six years. Okay. So, so I've written about four hundred blogs, but uh, now I'm starting to repeat myself because I'm so old. But, um, but anyways, um, yeah, there you get a lot of instructions, like the, the one that's going out this well, just went out today, actually, is uh, all the all the top videos I use when I teach. Okay, I have, have them listed there. So, so those things are educational for people just getting into it and seeing what it's like and so on. Uh, so, so those would be now if, if, if they're book readers, uh, God is at work by Ken Eldred is my favorite. Uh, um, I was wondering. Uh, and maybe you just answered it when you said some of your video references. Um, if someone wanted to dive a little deeper into the theological basis um, for BAM, um, mm -hmm. is there a video link on maybe one that went out today? Or uh, well, in that one, the, the, there's a the, the three minute one called "Work Work is Work is Worship." is in there, but that's that's. I mean, you can't get much theology in three minutes. But oh. um, what? Uh, what I would suggest is a book, a new one that came out is Workship, uh, Recalibrate Work and Worship. Um, now it's, it, it's not, it, you know, it's not, um, what do they call it in seminary? Uh, uh, systematic theology. It, it's yeah. practical theology. Uh -huh. and so, so his stories are built on uh, the, the theology of, of work. I, I think uh, that another place to, is to Google, because there's several sites on this one, Google the theology of work okay. or th theology dash work or something like that you'll come okay. up with several things a okay. lot of people working on that and there's that's where the theology would be rooted i would say well great that's helpful thank you so as i just think about i mean what you're talking about is that all of us can engage in mission wherever we are whatever we're doing and some are taking it overseas and um that I just love it that we as a church can, I think if we have a right theology of work, this will also, it'll flow, I think, more easily. And uh, yeah, I, I hate to say it, but my, my opinion is that the bottleneck is the church. And it's, it's, it's sad, but um, sometimes I'm tempted to say, forget the church. I'll just talk to business people in the church. Let mm -hmm. me go to coffee with them and you guys can do your thing over here. Yeah, but I mean, that's kind of a bad perspective but we're not we're all sinners i guess but um but 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 really the the, the the few in the church that are generally getting it are the people who who get i i, I took a guy who was the vice president of conoco he lived in houston he lived a high life he was well to do i took him to kazakhstan and he kind of wandered around and kind of wondered what he was doing and we were we were coaching businesses that were run by Kazakhs and also foreigners. And um, one day, a, a fellow came in who wanted to uh, start a feedlot because he'd gotten a lot of land from when the communes were disbanded when the Soviets left. 
And uh, all of a sudden, the, we were talking about contract law. And his ears picked up. And he spent a half a day talking to this guy about contract law. Now, what I know about contract law, we'd already be done. But, 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 nothing. But this was his expertise. He, oh. had, he had run. He was a lawyer. He was an executive with Conoco. He knew this stuff. And I, I remember parting from him in the Frankfurt airport and I went to Philly and he went to Houston. And he said, he said, I didn't know why I came on this trip, but now I know. Where are we going next? Hmm. It, the guy's life was changed because, mm -hmm. he, because he got involved. And he, it, so at the bottom of, you know, you could say change comes from the do top down or it goes from the bottom up. I, I think a lot of times it goes up from the bottom up when he goes back and talks to his pastor and says, look, do you want to have a Bible study about this? Let's do that. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how could the pastor say no? And, and so it's all in the scriptures that it, just like you said, Kara, it's all of us, every profession. It, uh, and it's one, once we do that in North America, it's only one more step to do it in the culture. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I love to, to think about, you know, if we equipped as the agencies got involved and, and better understanding how to equip so that we don't have these fiascos happening and people going over, but not really understanding how to engage cross-culturally, things like that. Yeah. Um, we could just, you know, set the world on fire with gospel. Yeah, absolutely yeah. true. Right. So thanks so much for your time. Is there any last minute thoughts or things you want to make sure to share with us? I don't think my boss in Crossworld would. Uh, you may know Dale Losh, Steve. I'm not sure. He, I've he probably he, met him once. He, he wrote the book, uh, A Better Way. And right. uh, he, he's retiring as president of Crossworld uh, next year. He, he said one time, he said, I spent 14 years in France. And I don't regret it in the sense of I, I was where I thought God wanted me. And there was some results. But he said, if I had to do it over again, I'd come to France. I take a job, I would be like everybody else, and live like Jesus. Mm. You know, and here's a, that's a he's a seminary graduate. He can he's a good speaker. He's a president on the mission, and he planted churches in France. But he said I could have been more effective huh. if I was like everybody else because they didn't wouldn't say to me, "Well, you're expected to be religious. You're a theologian, or you're expected to be a reason." They call them pastors over there, missionaries or pastors. Well, you're expected to be good. That's what church people do no no that's not why i'm good and, and you'd have a whole different image and basis for building a relationship if you were one of them and i, I that always stuck with me when he said that one day and i i think uh uh there's a lot of truth in that and that's what every christian should do just go and be like jesus uh -huh. okay mm -hmm. Well, okay. I'm leaving tomorrow to go somewhere. I'm not sure where, but anyway, well, this has, been, this has been a great conversation and I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Well, Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you, Larry. We're, yeah, th thanks for having me. Appreciate it. We're so grateful for your time. Thank you. Um, what did, stood out to you today about our conversation with Larry? Well, there were a lot of things. Um, first of all, I need to say that I didn't have a really clear understanding of business's mission. Um, I did have a conversation with Larry about a month ago just to get a little more information from him as we were planning this podcast. And I was really excited as he explained the idea of how someone can use a business and they can... Um, really help transform the area where they're going. And they can employ people. They um, can have a relationship with the local, um, you know, political slash governmental authorities and so on. But just the positive outcome and the positive impact it can have in so many different ways. And um, I was really encouraged to learn more about that. Yeah. Yeah, I was just so encouraged by that as well, is that, you know, you can take a business and you can transform a community and bring them the gospel at the same time, yeah. um, transform them both physically and spiritually. Yeah. Um, and just what a powerful thing that is. Um, so I just, I hope that lots of people heard that this is a really viable model of missions mm -hmm. and uh, that it that it's a church and is 
missions agencies and if we can really get involved and get behind this um, and really equip people to go well. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's yeah. probably what I heard of maybe is a little bit of a, a growth edge still right. is that, that we need to prepare them well mm -hmm. for cross-cultural ministry. Yeah. And, and I heard Larry say too, that so much, so much of the world is closed to the traditional missions model. Two thirds. And, uh, two thirds of the world. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, so that uh, we have the opportunity through an alternative model, such as business's mission or tent making, to go in and have an impact in some of these countries. Yeah. Well, I hope you were encouraged as you listened that maybe you, you and your church can find a way to get involved and encourage those who are serving already in this kind of way. And maybe you yourself are serving out there in this kind of way. And we just we want to bless you and encourage you in doing the work you're doing. And, and goodbye from now. See you next time. Thank you for joining us for the Innkeepers podcast. Our mission at Sanctuary Inn is to equip, refresh, and restore God's global workers. We hope today's podcast was an encouragement to you, or maybe the podcast you heard today, you've been prompted to pass this along to someone you know that could benefit from today's conversation. Creating a podcast is a team effort. Cara and I prepare and do the interviews, and we're grateful for the time that our guests give us out of their busy lives to help us learn more about missionary care. We want to thank Tim Downing for the music he wrote and performed for the Innkeepers podcast. Tim is a very talented musician, and you can find out more about Tim at downingkeys.com. Our podcast is edited by Javier Bolanos, and our website and show notes are prepared by Micah Githens, my amazing husband. You can visit the Sanctuary Inn website to see more of Micah's great work at sanctuaryinn.org. Thank you for joining us on our journey to learn more about missionary care.